the trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Our bestsellers, all they're hyped up to be. The Terrible Book Club explores whether or not you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. If you've ever seen a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. Hello and welcome to episode 124 of the Terrible Book Club. I'm Chris and this is Paris. Hello. This time we read Ralph 124C41 Plus, A Romance of the Year 2660 by Hugo Gernsback. This was published in 1911 by the author himself as a serial in his own Modern Electrics magazine and is considered an early and influential science fiction book. Notably, Mr. Gernsback managed to predict a lot of modern technology before it was ever conceived. Stuff like video calling and solar energy and a multitude of other things that we'll get into over the course of this episode. Yeah, and we were uh, asked to read this by our patron, Patricia. So thank you, Patricia, for uh, requesting this book and for being a patron. Uh, we hope this review is, is what you hoped for. Uh, if this is your first time listening to the show, what we do here at the Terrible Book Club is we read books that we assume will be bad based on their cover, title, summary, or some combination of the three. Sometimes, like today, we read books that our patrons, listeners, or friends recommend. Uh, but normally we do the opposite of what most people do at a bookstore or while they're browsing the internet looking for something to read. Most of the time, this experiment results in a disappointing and hilarious read, but, you know, once in a while, we actually end up liking the book. Um, in addition to our usual barnyard language, Today's episode includes discussion of kidnapping and there's single stabbing. It's all very like Disney levels of violence. Like there's, you know, yeah. there's really today's like, so whew, clean episode. Unlike last week, if you, if you were here last yeah. week, this is your, your bomb, your solve for all yes. those welts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, how would I do the back of the book summary, which again, I just pulled from Amazon. And then Paris can, as usual, give us the summary of the book that I wrote. By the year 2660, science has transformed and conquered the world, rescuing humanity from itself. Spectacular inventions <laughs> in the farthest reaches of space and deep beneath the Earth are available to meet every need, providing antidotes to individual troubles and social ills. Inventors are highly prized and respected, and they are jealously protected and lavishly cared for by world governments. That support and acclaim, however, as the most brilliant of scientists, Ralph 124C41 Plus, discovers is not without its price. This visionary novel of the 27th century was written by Hugo Gernsback, founder of the influential magazine Amazing Stories. Marvelously prophetic and creative, Ralph 124C41 Plus celebrates technological advances and entrances and entrances readers with an exuberant, unforgettable vision of what our world might become. Entrances. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. You know, when you see a word and you're trying to read a thing and you have to decide which of the versions of the word it is and you find yep. out it's not that version the further into the sentence you get. <laughs> yep, because English is terrible and <laughs> that should never happen. But here we are. Here uh, yeah. Also who humanity also got me. Uh Yeah. Sorry. I I say words weird when I'm in summary reading mode. Oh, <laughs> it's okay. All right, our characters and setting, our main character is Ralph, 124C41+. He is one of the 10 most scientists of science on Earth. Uh, you see the plus sign at the end of his name is indicative of his position as one of the only 10 most sciencey scientists in all of the... Go Top 10 science men. In, in all of the galaxy, solar system? Because it's not just Earth, it's also like... Mars, Venus, people seem to live on a few different planets. Anyhow, Ralph, he's just 
the inventor of all inventions. Um, then we have Alice, the woman that he is interested in. Uh, I kept thinking about her as Swiss Miss because she is from Switzerland and I could not remember her name throughout the entire book. I don't know why. Uh, it's just Alice doesn't stick in my brain for some reason. Uh, we have Alice's dad, James. He is also some kind of engineer or scienceman of some sort. And then we have Alice's stalkers, uh, stalker number one, Fernand, and stalker number two, the Martian Lysenor. Lysenor. By the way, we're dropping off the fact that everyone else that is from Earth or is human also has numbers after their name and like letter designations, which is never explained really. But we're just calling them Ralph and Alice and James and Fernand. Because yeah, amazing. the only thing we, the only part of the the number um, suffixes that are explained is the plus sign, where we learn oh, only ten people have the plus, and it's a big deal because it means you're one of the top scientists, you know, in the solar system i guess i'm just gonna guess but yeah we don't get any <laughs> any explanation for one two four c or the 41 or you know alice's dad james is like james zero oh eight b or something like that yeah i forget that's not right but it's something like that anyhow uh, all right i'm gonna read the uh the summary the plot summary so you understand all of the main events uh so as we move through our commentary you will kind of understand what the fuck we're talking about this summary was written by Chris, as most of them are. <laughs> Ralph 124C41 Plus is a super smart scientist man who invents something new every other week, and that's all he spends his time on. One day, a misconnection on a telephot call he makes results in him meeting Alice, a Swiss woman literally currently trapped in a cabin that's about to be destroyed by an avalanche. Using his superior knowledge and big tech brain, Ralph is able to save her by shooting some kind of radio wave that makes it so that flames shoot out from receiving towers near the cabin to melt the avalanche. Alice and her father are overjoyed and fly to New York the next day to meet and thank Ralph in person. Ralph never bothered with dating because of all the inventing, but boy does he like Alice. He spends most of the book showing her the technological marvels of New York City in the year 2660. I don't know why she wouldn't know about this stuff. I guess because Europe is somewhat less advanced. They've got weather control towers, metal sidewalks and streets, incredible food production, streaming services, super fast package delivery, flying cars, space vacation cities, superb trust in their monetary system, and even a little reviving the dead. Anyway, Alice has two suitors that are both madly in love with her. One, Fernand, is just some guy, and the other, Lysenor, is a Martian. Fernand kidnaps Alice and flies off into space with her, with Ralph in hot pursuit. However, Lysenor gets to Fernand first and kidnaps Alice from him. Girl can't catch a break even in space. Ralph catches up with Fernand, realizes Alice isn't there, and rushes off to catch up with Lysenor. But he can't overtake him, so he pretends to be a comet on an impact course with Mars so that Lysenor must intercept him to save the planet. Ralph is able to link up with his ship, but just before he enters the ship, Lysenor stabs Alice in the shoulder, fatally wounding her, but also killing himself. However, Ralph had recently revived a dog who had been dead for three years and is able to get Alice back to Earth and perform a similar procedure on her. Then she wakes up and presumably they live happily ever after. And the story ends with probably the worst, the worst tagline <laughs> I've ever read in a book. <laughs> that was by far the worst part of the book yeah. was that ending bit yep. there. So maybe we should actually start with that because it's truly emblematic of how dorky this book is overall. Yeah. So the final line of the book, uh, before we go into things that were good, let me just, let me just read like the final couple lines. Um, hmm, um, I can't talk very loud. She whispered. My lungs and vocal cords are not strong yet, but the nurse said I might speak just a few words. But I wanted to tell you something. What is it, my darling? He asked tenderly. She looked at him with the old sparkle of mischief in her dark eyes. Dearest, she said, I have just found out what your name really means. Ralph twined a little tendril of her hair around one of his fingers. Yes? He asked with a quizzical smile. Well, you see, and the lovely color deepened to rose. Your name is going to be my name now. So I keep saying it over to myself. My darling, one, two, four, C, four, one. Wait, what the? <laughs> I don't like okay. one, one, two, okay, four, I C. Yeah, I get that the whole book is about predicting stuff, mm -hmm. and Ralph is the one, two, four, C. But then, why the four, one? I 
maybe Who's it's like the one? maybe it's like you know maybe maybe it's like a, a little microwave meal you know it's like one to four oh. C for one <laughs> for one <laughs> no, it's no, just for Alice for everyone right so yeah. Ralph, Ralph just for Alice I think I think that's kind of what they're going for what like a, what a romantic thought that there that you are my small microwaved dinner for me just for me yeah you I think that's what they're going sad for mashed potatoes. You've got that little <laughs> steak that's in there. You've got the coldest corn in existence, no matter how much you heat it up. <laughs> but then one of them is full of molten fucking lead. <laughs> and you bite into it unsuspectingly, and then your mouth it's is... corn roulette. <laughs> it's corn... <laughs> corn roulette. Good old corn roulette. Just for you. Just for you. Um, yeah, so I think that's what they were going for. But it is... It's not a. It's not good. <laughs> it's so. It sounds so self satisfied. Like yeah. this dude like came up with that name, and he was like, "Oh wait, I'm gonna wait till the very end and let him know what that that those numbers mean." Do you think he came up with that as a sci fi sounding name, and then just added the number system to everyone else's name to kind of like justify that kind of thing? Oh yeah, absolutely. So so actually, all right. You know what? We can start on things that were good about this book because this is one of those things. In one of the forewords, it's actually by the author himself, he straight up says, like, L- yo, I had no plan for this. I don't know what the fuck I was doing. I was just having a good time. And I was like, honestly? I mean, word, honestly, I totally, because that's what this feels like, right? Just some guy, like, coming up with ideas that he had for future tech. Yeah, and, and ha- you know, and that forward was used well, right? Where we... <laughs> We we get the author's intentions, and you're like, okay, this makes sense. Like, I get what you get what you're doing. Unlike the forward from the last book that would kind of cause yeah. more problems than it solved. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So, I would say that this is a good use of Bad a forward. forward. Good forward. Yeah, where four word the number four were I don't know. Uh, <laughs> four four word C. No. One two <laughs> four. Three. Uh, anyhow, I thought that the forward was, yeah, it was a good use of one. And, and yeah, it just revealed that, you know, the author, this this was published as a serial, you know, and if you're unfamiliar with that, this is, uh, this would be a story told in small installments in a magazine over a long period of time so that the author could kind of just, you know, write at a reasonable pace and most of the time get paid for a little bit of writing at a time rather than like waiting for a giant lump sum at the end of a larger book. I mean, this was published in his own magazine, so I don't think he was paying himself for it, but you know, it allows somebody to just work on a little bit of a story at a time. And um, also to kind of keep up uh, anticipation, I guess, in your audience anyway. um, And also I think the forward showed the author to be pretty humble. He was just like, wow, you know, I, I can't believe that people think that this book means anything. Um, yeah, I keep <laughs> seeing it brought up in histories of sci-fi, and it surprised me. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, decent. Head- I mean, let's be real. This is a nice segue into what we're going to say next. Here, he predicted a lot of stuff in 1911. He had a lot of forward-thinking ideas, and he was on top of things. Yeah, dude. This, this so that's that's honestly like the most fun thing about this book is reading about all these inventions that you know now are real, and that didn't even many of these weren't even, you know, uh, seeds of thought in any inventor's mind at this point, at least that we know of. So, he, I mean, the book talks about, like, basically uh, internet streaming, kind of. <laughs> um, yeah, it totally has internet streaming in it a hundred fucking years and, ago. And subscriptions. Um, yes, they have, there's uh, Patreon in this shit. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, there's artificial cloth, artificial milk, um, so like a uh, video calling, uh, solar energy. Mm, uh, there's a ton of. There's also other stuff that I, I understood less of because it was a little too sciency for for my dumb smooth brain. Um, but yeah, it was just really wild. Uh, oh, also like radar, sonar or radar. I actually forget. No way. I think shit. Did those both exist already? Is radar and sonar one of the things? Uh, I mean, he definitely radar, talks radar. about radar. It's radar. Yeah. Sonar was already a thing. It's radar that is that is described. Yeah, that was new. So it's really fun to to see these like these predictions, and they're quite detailed. It's not like I think a lot of more modern sci fi books don't really get into this level of detail where he really explains like step by step how something works, which is pretty cool. Um, I, I think. 
Yeah, for the most part. Do you think that's a function of the fact that in our modern day era, we kind of have to take for granted how things work? Like no one, there's not really any one person that can explain to you how a phone works from like starting as rocks in the ground and turning into a phone that can tra transmit messages. There's people who can write the code for the camera. There's people that can construct the phone. There's people that can build the chips and, you know, no, but there's not one person out there that can explain to you how you take rocks from the ground, mash them up in a certain way, and then write code and shoot zappy electricity through it in the right way to turn it into what we're doing here now, Paris, which is communicating to each other through the internet. But back then, things were simpler, and so you could kind of explain things in a few more steps? I don't know. I mean, I want to say you're right, but I do not know enough about the history of technology uh, <laughs> to, to really agree either way. But I want to say you're right, because that that's the thing. Like, whenever, I, I, I know I've talked about this before on the show, how I feel like technology is just straight up fucking magic a lot of the time. Because there's a point where, like you're saying, you know, we take literal crystals from the ground fucking throw electricity at them and connect them to other crystals with wire and other rocks. And then somehow that's, that's what's enabling us to call each other on this fucking screen across space and time. And I just and like, gap into your ears, listener about books that we've read. Yeah. It's like, you know, there are certain, like you're saying there's certain components of it that you can explain, but I, I also, I, I get really lost at like rocks and energy, <laughs> like, I can't really lost. I mean, I'm sure someone could explain it to us if they were um, some kind of specialized technological physicist or something. I'm not yeah, really but even sure. Even then, they would only get pieces of it at a time. That one person does not exist that can explain to you top to bottom how to take a, the materials, build a phone, and also program it. Like that layer of software abstraction on yeah. top of it as well. Like once you get to like how to put all that together into the phone sandwich that I mind the phone here. sandwich. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I'm sure there are people, but it is, it does feel like things are more abstracted. Uh, anyhow. Yeah. So, so there is, um, it, so kind of spinning off of that, the way that Ralph and Alice, you know, our two, our two romantic leads here meet is actually believable where I feel like in a lot of stories, it's either just like, Oh, they bumped into each other and you're like, whatever, or, or it's ridiculous. And it's like they're neighbors in, and they don't recognize each other in the dark, even though they went to college together, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, or something, you know, something silly, um, or, you know, some, yeah, somehow they end up in the same beach town, eh, whatever. But in this one, they mean, oh, no, because we bumped into each other by stepping on the same pile of dog shit in the street. <laughs> and then it was yeah. love at first sight. At least in this one, it's like, well, they get misconnected because even though there's video calling, uh, there are still operators in this world. So they haven't. So this is like a hilarious a take. Cute little contrivance yeah, that's happening yeah. there. Like you still have to ask the operator person nicely. Can you please connect me to this person? But also that works for the subscriptions to like theater services and the streaming services. So I can't help but imagine someone in this version of the future going... Yes, operator, can you connect me to the porn hub, please? Oh, of Thank course, you. sir. Which subsection would you like to be subscribed to? Um, uh, you know the one. We talked about this already last week. Who am I kidding? Yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, such word operators would have the dirt on everybody, huh? If that were the case. Um, <laughs> or even just like asking them like, okay, I want to watch the cat compilation video Again, please. Can you please send me the 20 minute cat compilation video of cats pushing stuff off sir, the shelf? Sir, there are 1,300,000 20 minute <laughs> videos of, of cat of cats. Which, uh, the which... one where like it starts with the one where it's like the ladies in <laughs> Russia or something and she tells the cat not to push it, but then it looks at her and pushes it off anyway. And she's like asking him not to. And then it like it f it's followed up by the one where there's a, like a, a cat's looking at a cucumber and it scares it and it jumps over the fat. You know, that one. Uh, okay. If we're talking Russian to cucumber, that's, there's about, there's 15 of those. So. All right. You know what? Just connect <laughs> me to all of them. I'm not doing anything else tonight. I already, I, you, we already went through the Pornhub thing, so I'm kind of tired anyways. It's just like, you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. So I, I don't know. I just think it's. Sir, it's, you need to stop reading fan fiction at three in the morning, please. I have to <laughs> fucking transcribe it to you over this. And I'm tired of reading about Sonic having sex with Princess Peach. <laughs> well, it's not that they have to. No, they have a different mechanism for um, <laughs> for sending out written electronic yeah. data. But anyway, yeah, I thought I thought it made sense in the world, you know, that that he had created. It was a good thing to point out. Perhaps the contrivance of the fact that he gets connected to her in like right before an avalanche was about to hit her cabin. And she's kind of like cheerfully talking to him because he's well known. And then she's like, actually, you know, there's this avalanche. Well, no, I think I think they're talking and then the av- they hear the avalanche begin. I don't it, it it's not in progress when they're on the call because <laughs> okay. that would be more yes. ridiculous. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, and we, we could talk about the the bad part of, of all of that later but for now the good stuff um i would say yeah the world building is is pretty detailed and interesting i think there's a lot of effort put into building a convincing future world right with all these nifty inventions and efficiencies and exploration and things and yeah the level of detail is really cool i enjoyed that it's like a early 20th century version of Professor Frank wrote a romance novel <laughs> where he is not at all concerned with the romance plot. He's really just wants to like maybe a little bit because he wants there to be just a woman who is impressed by all the cool shit he came up with. But the romance here is just slapped on top so that you have a reason for Ralph to talk to you about all the cool shit that's going on. Yeah, in this world. It's, well, we're, we're, we're trying to talk about the, the good things about this book. Yeah. Uh, so... I like that. No, I think that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, I think I think in I think in the in one way it is, and we can talk a little later about why it's not. But yeah, I agree that it's you know, it the primary plot is not romance, which is something we're both happy about. You know, we'd we'd rather have the sci fi up front and the romance in the back or not at all. You know, out the airlock <laughs> in my case. The new hairstyle. Uh, <laughs> sci fi in the front, romance out the Rom- airlock. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that would look like. Um, Just a very big blown out mullet that like, you know, expands from the back. It's like a (laughs) mullet and like a perm that like extends from the back, but it's all like very shortcut efficient hair up front. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good. Uh, Yeah, I mean, (laughs) Um, oh, uh, Patreon 100 years ago, Chris, this is all you. Okay, yeah, so I have a bone to pick, not with this book, but with our modern reality that we exist in today. <laughs> yeah, Chris, I have, this. I have many bones to pick with reality, but go for it. <laughs> go for it. So this guy, there's a scene where when Alice is hanging around with him one night, he's like, let's go to my theater room where we can watch the French National Opera and their performance that is happening this evening. You... you You can subscribe to each opera house or entertainment venue, and then you can pull in a broadcast of what is happening that evening, which is, you know, super clear, and the sound is like they're just standing right there next to you. Um, Why aren't venues now doing this? We have subscription models. We have Patreon. It wouldn't take too much to take one extra output from your mixer, send that to another computer. I mean, most mixers are digital anyway, and they're outputting via USB a submix to a computer that's controlling half the stuff anyway. Slap a video camera somewhere in the venue, sell a subscription where you can tune in to tonight's show for, I don't know, $30 a month, $40 a month, and you would pull in so much more Chris, money. It's like money left on the table. I would do Chris, this all the time. I would support so many venues that th- did this. Chris, the answer to why this isn't happening is because of how fucked up copyright law is in the United States. Oh, because, it's performance royalties, is, yeah, it, is it? It's performance royalties and the rights to stream and stuff. It's it's very convoluted, and there have been... Like, for example... Um, you can't have virtual karaoke. A lot of bars that have tried it have gotten sued <laughs> because they're technically broadcasting, you know. A, yeah, that's the why same. you can't. I mean, Twitch yeah, it's, had this it's, whole deal with mm-hmm. like, copyrighted music. Yeah, and it gets it gets to the absurdest point where artists themselves can't even televise or virtualize their performances. And it, it's, yeah, it's really fucked up and weird. I so I think that's why which sucks a lot because I agree with you I think it's a great idea and I don't know why the fuck 
we can't write some laws around that for you know notably for theaters yeah it doesn't where, have to be that <laughs> way it right like, no you can it doesn't change that but also on top of that, okay, so even if that's the case here, why not for smaller independent venues that host acts that don't have to deal with these bigger things? I know like your Spotify, like, you know, content ID might get wrapped up in that somehow because just, you know, everything is being run by unfeeling algorithms and AIs that might catch that broadcast or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that, that's but the But at the other same problem. time, you should be able to just, it should just be a checkbox on my DistroKid account. Hey, I don't care if, you know, this is being broadcast because I'm the one doing the performance. Or even you can, I don't know have a way to like verify that you're the one doing the performing by like, I don't know, waving a chip at the venue's <laughs> front door at their QR thing. Yeah. We can do this. The tech is here. This dude imagined it a hundred years ago. It's possible. I, yeah, I know. I feel the same way. I feel like it should be so easy to just be like, Hey, I'm submitting this form saying that I am this person and this is my band and we're performing here. And we know about this stream. Like it just seems so fucking ridiculous that it's, it's gotten automated and big enough that it is out of control and now people now we can't have subscriptions to theaters i can't watch ballet from my house everything sucks or like, <laughs> fine like you know every band that comes through they get a small cut of that streaming royalty but it's literally just an easily set up a bowl revenue stream that does not take that much investment beyond the initial camera and the audio setup that you already had for live yeah. shows anyway I think I think people also I think another reason why this isn't popular is because when patrons come into a venue, it, it's not really the cover charge that, that the venue cares about. What the venue oh, cares yeah, about the is the, it's alcohol, it's food. If, if you have a venue that has food um, or non-alcoholic drinks, too, and merchandise, it's all that stuff. It's it's all the like collateral sales that are more important than the actual sure. ticket price. You can still get people that cannot travel to that venue for that show or yeah. big festivals even. No, big I, festivals I agree. That are um, and there have been, I have seen some festivals broadcast things. Like, yeah. I think. Um, Inferno did, did it one year. Yeah, Inferno. And I think, did Vakken do it as well? I think one year, yeah. And, like, I'm <sighs> glad to be seeing that. And I think you should be able to just pay, like, you know, 40, 50 bucks to, like, watch that stream. Yeah. And I think that only happened because of the exigent circumstances of the pandemic, which forced people to, you know, come up with these other. And it's like, of course, uh, it takes a pandemic to do what people with disabilities have been asking for for fucking ever, you know, right. like just make exactly. things accessible. And, and I mean, that's a major reason I can't yeah. see a lot of shows because the train travel time is ridiculous. I can't go out to the Palladium in Worcester and see the shows that I want to see or even like other venues like Ralph's and stuff, which has had great metal shows a lot of the time. Yeah, I mean, I, I've yeah, I've done a lot of couch surfing and fucking getting rides with all sorts of friends just so I can go to things, too, because I at least. You know, we live in a city in Boston where um, having a car can be prohibitively expensive unless you make a certain amount of money. So, um, well, you know, Chris has his uh, vision to contend with. I, I just had poverty, you know, <laughs> but, you know, both, <laughs> but, you know, almost equally that, debilitating. Yeah, that, no, not equally. Uh, but, you know, both both issues that could have been could be solved by <laughs> virtual experiences. All right. Yeah, I just had to get that rant i know we ate up like four minutes here but it's it's as a performing artist and a live music consumer yes there's you'll never feel the same as if you're in the room listening to it that's definitely a different experience but i watched like youtube videos of bands performing live all the time because it's still so cool to watch we should be doing this we can ha make it happen please god let this happen yeah i agree with you i really wish this is something that would happen both for the benefit of folks who have disabilities or, you know, who can't, whatever, can't get to venues. I mean, I think, I think that it would actually be, it'd be great for bands too, because we'd have as performers, we'd have the ability to actually make more money. I think if, if we were able to profit, if we were able to get a cut of streams, you know, or yeah, whatever, or exactly. sub subscriptions, would, sorry, whatever. I've been to a ton of concilium shows, but I would go to them all if I could just buy in to your ticket. There's even been like, there was a really cool metal show last week that I would have gone to over at Sammy's Patio and Revere, one of my favorite venues because they're so very nice to us in Graveborn. But there was a sick metal show happening there with like Averse and Perennial Quest 
and a couple of other cool acts. And I would have gone, except I had to quarantine because I was, you know, exposed to COVID, actually. Well, I'm fine po- now. Thank well you. potentially, but you didn't potentially. actually, but you tested negative. So, but I tested, well, I mean, there was like people that were positive for COVID and like I was just being safe about it that whole time. But I had to miss that show. And I actually asked I, the, the promoter, I was like, can I just buy a ticket? Cause this is a sick show and I want to like, you know, just support the, the venue. And he's like, just save your money, dude. But it's like, I would. I would have bought into a stream. Well, I would hundred percent subscribe to the Sammy's Patio Patreon. (laughs) Sammy's Patio Patreon, free chicken wing, Um, (laughs) free chicken wing with each subscription. We'll mail you one chicken wing. (laughs) That's just the style of that place. Um, (laughs) uh, Shit, what was I going to say? Um, Yeah, in that case, I would just recommend you just go shoot them some money on their Bandcamp or wherever they have merch or. You know, whatever. That's what I ended up doing. Know, that's that's what I do whenever I can't get to a show. Anyhow, uh, musician rant end. Sorry. Yes, let's get back Sorry, to the y'all. point of this podcast, the book. All right. The other things that were good about this book. Um, Chris, you, you made a, a wonderful note that I appreciated. So for once in a book, the men, the men in the book who are stalking the main character and are obsessed with her are actually painted as as villains which is great because i feel like they're bad people for being like this their persistence is bad and evil and not good for alice yeah and not good for them either it doesn't really work out well for them uh and i just wish more modern books uh stuck with that model from 1911 can we go back to 1911 i mean it's still this cool. very like you know super mario ass save the princess <laughs> games in distress shit happening here yeah this but is like, Su- super know. mario galaxy for sure uh <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we never hear his voice. Ralph could very well be an Italian plumber that, you know, gave up his life of turtle stomping. Oh, my God. Chris, put his Chris brain- he's from New York City. That's true. <laughs> it's a me, Ralphio. <laughs> I invented stilonium. <laughs> Holy shit. All the names of things in this are very Mario-y. Like- yeah, it's permagatol. And- <laughs> oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. I just took the blue shell and I squished it up and now I can find anyone anywhere. That's my package delivery <laughs> system. You have to be in first place, though. That It can only find you if you're in first place. <laughs> oh, the package delivery systems are so efficient because they employ toads. <laughs> Toad stools. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, damn. Um, great. Now I'm just reimagining this entire book as Super Mario Galaxy. And I really wish that I had, I had that information while I was reading it because it would have made it... Much more fun. Toad postal work. <laughs> Where's the package going? <laughs> Princess Alice. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Chris, uh, you have a final point about romance. So I'm going to let you go for it before we get to the things. That we're as we said, yeah, as we said, this is very much a book where the focus is talking about the cool technology stuff that the author could think up. And the romance subplot is just a contrivance to have it fictionalized in this sort of world where they can move about and interact with all these inventions instead of just having it be a list of ideas in a magazine, which is a little bit drier to read. So I'm not sure if I appreciate this type of romance happening in a book, because while it's definitely the driving force of the quote unquote plot here, the very paper thin plot of like, I took this lady around town and showed her cool stuff. But then her uh, other suitor tried to kidnap her with this cool spaceship, which I will also describe to you how that works. And then I had to go after him and use my big, cool tech brain and space knowledge to save her, which I will also explain to you how that works, because isn't that so neat? So it's not the focus of the book, the romance stuff here. So I think I'm kind of okay with that, because that's what I like. I'm a big fantasy and sci-fi reader. Honestly, I'll be on. like, you guys should know this by now, the major... The biggest part of what I consume as a reader is fantasy and sci-fi books, and I kind of like it when... You got to have the romance and, you know, relationships in there somewhere because that's just part of being a human being. And if you have a huge cast of characters, 
that's going to be part of it, some of these romantic interactions. But when it's not the driving basis for the plot, like say something like Sword of Truth, where it's about Richard and Kalen's how much they really like each other and how they can't fuck because of all this magic reasons around them. Or even MHI, where it's like about getting the girl and saving her with your, you know, superior monster hunting skills or something like that. That's not as interesting to me and I hate it. But something in like... um the Expanse, yes, there is a romantic interaction between two main characters that, you know, is the reason they want to save each other and care for each other, but it's not the main reason for the plot. And even the fantasy series that I'm reading right now that I'm really super into, uh, Brandon Sanderson's The Stormlight Archives, shout out to The Stormlight Archives for being really dope. There's romantic interactions there, but they're very, you know, third level to what else is going on in the plot. And that is what's more interesting to me. Even something like Game of Thrones, where you have like political marriages and stuff like that happening, the romance is less a part of it. It's there because this is how humans interact, and that's the interesting part. But it's not the driving force of the plot. Yeah, and I think, um, although I haven't read Stormlight Archives, I've read a, a little about them and Sanderson's writing in general. And I think, yeah, I think both there. In a Song of Ice and Fire and, you know, various other books um, that I've read, the the relationships are there, not as a crutch, which is, which is what we're getting at here, right? Like, y- these stereotypical crutches that people use in stories are the things that Chris and I really hate. And, uh, yeah, that's one of them. Although, you know, we are about to talk about all the stereotyping in this and, like, why it's bad and things like that, but... Uh, yeah, at least, at least here, the romance is, you know, taking a bit of a backseat. It's, it's also pretty shallow and cartoonish. Like the whole thing is sort of like a Saturday morning cartoon about, yeah, you like, said before, very Disney-like. Yeah, like, it's like Inspector Gadget gets a girlfriend or something, like, yeah. <laughs> in 2660. Like, he's still kicking around and he falls in love or something. You know, it's, it's kind of. It's really, it's very lighthearted, even though people die in it. I know, again, very Disney levels of sort of lightheartedness. There's some stakes, but like, you're not going to see too much gore or blood or like horror or anything like that. Or <sighs> I, I would actually say there are no stakes because, because it is, you know, that flavor. But um, anyway, yeah. before we get into the things that were not good, I did want to say the technical writing was actually fine. It was pretty decent. I didn't, there were no typo i think there was like one typo maybe um oh you know the sentences read like sentences the you know the the dialogue and the characters were a little cheesy but i mean they were very tw- early 20th century yeah there's a couple know. of lines in there that are very early 20th century like um actually let me see if i can find the one that i really enjoyed that sounded i think the character saying it was deliberately supposed to be sort of a pastiche of some kind of like 20s gangster type or something like that <laughs> hold on give me a minute yeah here, i should I... oh no it's fine i was actually while i was reading this and i was thinking oh you know the writing is actually pretty decent i was like fuck what would have happened if we got karnaki in the year of 2660 <laughs> oh lord <laughs> Because we're karnaki these... space ghost finder because were these contemporaries grins back and fucking karnaki's i think author. so i can't quite I think remember so. let's let's find out yeah so those were published in 1913 two years after this so okay Hod- so they were contemporaries yeah but i mean Hod- hodgson was in england i think so i've got it i've got the line oh okay go ahead then I says to myself, says I, there's something strange about this, I says. I'd better be on the lookout. I might be needed, for it looks to me, I says, as though someone was up to something. <laughs> I says? Oh, very, yeah. The- yeah, man, I see here. I says someone's up to something. See here? Oh, that was the guy that worked at the store that Alice got like yes. kidnapped in. And I think they were yes. trying to go for... Hey, gritty New Yorker, hey, says, yes, you know. <laughs> it's totally a character that they're doing, yeah. but it's, it was just pretty funny. Um, Yeah, let me see. Uh, I'm trying to find a piece of writing that was okay. Uh, 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 okay, I guess I can read this little bit about Alice being imprisoned by Ferdinand. <sighs> 
Alone, she passed from the high exaltation of anger to a state of nervous apprehension. Another woman in her place might have wept, have begged piteously for mercy where there was no mercy, but this girl was made of sterner stuff. She might be frightened, but Fernand should never guess it. Dry-eyed, with lips set in a firm line, lest they tremble and betray her, she sat facing the door, gripping in her small hands the only weapon she had been able to find, a small metal vase having a round and fairly thick base. Knowing that Fernand would come back, prepared as she was for his return, she was unable to repress a start of genuine terror when she heard someone unbolting the door. She clutched the vase more tightly, white-faced but courageous. I don't know. I just thought, like, writing is decent. Yeah. It's fine. Um, yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, it's all right. Um, you know, like I said, the you know, dialogue gets a little, a little silly here and there, but it's, I mean, compared to a lot of the stuff that we've read for the show, I gotta say, this was pretty fine. Fu- okay, palatable. it was fine. It's fine. It's, you know, pulpy, serialized sci-fi written by Professor Frank from the past, so it's gonna be yeah. a little bit dorky, but that's kind of like the charm of it, in a way. Yes, it does have a certain dorky, early 20th century charm. All right, so let's uh, let's talk about um, let's talk about things that were not good. I'm actually gonna say that there were some there were some like plot points and ele- and story elements that just didn't really work for me. Um, there's like Chekhov's maid here, you know, or or I guess anti Chekhov's maid. There, there's just a character in the story who is this Lynette or Lilette or whatever this maid who is on Fernand's spaceship uh, when he's planning on capturing Alice. And then she, and then the maid also gets dragged to Lysenor's ship when Alice gets captured by Lysenor. And then she just dies at the end. She literally serves no purpose. Yeah. Um, is there, that was, that was just like, I don't know. I think he was just getting lazy. It was toward the end. He was like, oh, I just want to fucking finish the story. I don't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's was a maid. Just to be yeah. kind of like the help that, you know, cause like everyone has a butler or a maid if you're moneyed at all, I suppose. I guess, but it yeah, seemed pretty weird. Uh, and then there was also like, there was at least one chapter where we didn't learn anything new. It was just a flashback to when Alice had been, captured by Fernand and I was like what do we learn from this all we really learned was just that Alice didn't take her capture sitting down but that could have come out yeah. somewhere else I don't it, there there was weirdly there was a little like two they could have cut a chapter or two I guess is all I'm saying um it's not a I mean you gotta get, sin, the, the next issue is coming out he just had to come up with something so he just retold the last chapter yep, from Fernand's that is, perspective that is instead. yes that is exactly <laughs> what happened <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um there were also some points some points that just didn't make sense. Like, all of a sudden, he's like, oh, I'm going to check the International Hotel because I know Ferdinand's staying there. And I'm like, how do you know he's staying there? That's never come up in the story before. There were some There's other... like, many places people vacation. There's, like, a floating space city where people can travel to and stay for a while. And it takes, like, ten minutes to get up there and back anyway. So it's not like it's harder to get to than a hotel in the city. So how do you know? How do you know he's in that one? Yeah, um, I, I mean, unless we both missed it, I I did not see that anywhere else. Um, there were there were just a few other things that were also a little strange, like how quickly everyone jumps to murder in this story is a little strange, considering this is a future They're ready to kill. Everyone is ready to kill well, in the future. Yeah, well, and I say it's strange because everyone is really civil, and there's also this undertone of extreme, like law abidingness <laughs> yes is, uh, i mean ralph can't even fathom why anyone would write um a bad check or at yes, one point in the story they've all figured out that money is basically made up and speculative based on you know the intri- not intrinsic value but the assumption and the trust that someone will get the credit back to you or that they have this money and he just says, oh, no one would ever write a bad check because you'd get fined or jailed for it. And I'm like, bro, they, people would find ways around that or they would just fucking pay the fine and come out on top anyway. Yeah. I don't understand why you think like uh, everyone just trusts money in the right way. And I agree that, yes, essentially at this point, especially in this part of the future, he was totally correct in that it's all debits and credits and just a number kept track of yeah. in a computer somewhere. And there's not really much actual monetary value anywhere. So in a way, if we all just decided on it, we could just distribute resources to each other equitably. It's just that we have these hang-ups. <laughs> I, love about, how, like, I love how 
how you just fucking turned that that communist corner there. Just whoop, just. I mean, I'm just saying, like, if we're all going to admit <laughs> okay, that it's social, all just numbers kidding. in a computer, yeah, then we could, you know, it, it, if you just got over this hang up that, like, because I worked at this one type of thing, it has more value than this other, you know, because you worked at, you're the owner of Tesla, your hour is worth billions more than the guy that has to make 100 burgers in an hour or something like that. Yeah. Well, but yeah, I won't fly on that topic too much. Just back yeah, to the point that like well, different his skill trust levels that everyone is yada, law yada. abiding is is unbelievable to me. It's the most unbelievable thing about this book. We yeah. like, oh, no one would write a bad check because they'd go to jail. Why would you ever do that? Yeah, and then there there's like there's other points too where it's just like oh right, like Martians and terrestrials, so people from Earth are not allowed to be or not allowed to marry, and it just literally never happens because it's outlawed. And I'm like. People would still cohabitate. They would still have relationships. Also, the Martian like, tries to marry Alice at the end. Yes. Well, no, <laughs> he doesn't, actually. He says, like, there's a marriage ceremony we're going to do on Mars. I guess it's the Martian no, marriage. No, 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 no. That's, that's not his plan. That's what Ralph thinks uh, he's going to do. But uh, he doesn't. Um, yeah, and the, but, then all, but then all of a sudden it's like, Ah, yes, I know. We'll just murder him. And it's like, well, wait, wait a second. <laughs> what happened to all the law abiding? Yeah, yeah. It's just like people jump real fast to like killing each other. Ralph's when... ready to kill Fernand immediately upon oh, yeah. the kidnapping happening. Mm-hmm. Not even just apprehend both of them and like turn Fernand into the authorities. He's ready to murder over it. And Lysenor is ready to kill Alice and himself because yeah. he can't be with her. I mean, he does, ultimately. Um, yes. <laughs> that's, yeah. So. Anyway, I'm just going to, like, tick off some weird things. There's a point where he's using goat and dog blood interchangeably, and I was like, I don't <laughs> know if you could do that. Well, yeah, I mean, when he's reviving the dog, he's like, just put some goat blood in there. I'm like, I think there's a little bit, like, if we have to be careful about what kind of human blood we're exchanging, I think goat and dog are uh, different enough. Yeah, that was the same thought I had, but I'm also not a not a goatologist, so I I or a or a like dogophile, so I don't know. Even a bloodologist, uh, even. Yeah, um, I'm not. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm Did not you also sure. Find it strange in the last scene where when they were reviving Alice, they're like, we brought in one of her cousins to exchange blood with her. I was like, was that voluntary? <laughs> I mean, probably not for like the one of the ten top scientists in the fucking solar system. You probably just go and bring your blood. Yeah, and don't complain like, about oh, it. Like, oh crap! Ralph demanded my blood. I gotta give it to him because he wants to save his girlfriend, my cousin. Fucking Alice! God damn it! God damn it! Why didn't you just die in that fucking avalanche? <laughs> uh, there are also, you know, some like. I think ramifications of some of these inventions that weren't quite thought out, you know, there's this idea that, Oh, well we have enough control of the weather. Uh, you know, har- harp has, has really taken over. Yes. <laughs> That's it's an joke. extremely precise harp machine. It's a joke. I know what harp is. I know it's not an evil weather controlling machine. It's a joke. Um, anyway, the, in this book, there's, you know, perfect weather control, especially in New York city. For some reason, uh, New York city is like the height of all, inventions and and technology and whatnot so it's always what 72 degrees and it only rains for one hour at night and all the streets are made out of stelonium and and i was just like but wouldn't that be fucking disastrous for like the non-human environment say i don't know plants soil ants like all of that would also affect the air quality. So I was having a little trouble imagining this landscape where there's like no organic matter. And I just, I was like, I don't know. You kind of have to come up with a lot of other systems to correct the errors of the first system. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, that was, this a was problematic. written at a time where he thought that if you vibrated the air enough, it would turn everything dark because of the light <laughs> ether. Yeah. So, they you know, so they were behind on some, they yeah. were behind on a couple of things and probably they weren't considering about like the interlocking nature of ecosystems too hard. True. Even though that was still kind of a studied subject back then. Yeah. I mean, it's been a studied subject for fucking eons. <laughs> But yes. but yeah, understanding in the Western world at that time was you know maybe not great. Uh, there's also this idea that f- there are now restaurants where food is just 
delivered to your mouth via tube and it's all liquefied and that just made me want to throw up because yeah no thanks uh-huh. i need textures like i like smoothies but only with fruit i don't don't give there me was, some yeah. fucking vegetable smoothie get out of here with your meat smoothies. there was a whole paragraph where it was like well people took a long time to adapt to it because it was a strange new way but they found out that it was easier to digest overall and that made everyone do that i was like no I, this te- the textural aspect of food is still a big part of the experience you're gonna have people that want the real thing anyway and also they eat a regular meal later on at the yeah farm. so that that just seemed kind of like a silly future idea yeah. you know <laughs> uh it's back to but back to like things that sort of confused me or that <laughs> i felt this restaurant piss food into my mouth forever. <laughs> well i guess some people are uh, into that maybe <laughs> yeah, um <that's> true. <laughs> this is the future for them um th- so there there's talk in in the book in the early part that um alice and her father james are so intent on thanking Ralph in person for saving Alice's life that they get in, they actually take an experimental ride on the underwater underground tube system that goes from Europe to America that was just built. And they were like, Oh, it only took 12 hours, you know, but then a little later they talk about how they have, um, flying, uh, flying machines, aero cabs that, can travel at 600 miles per hour. And I'm like, if you have machines that can fly 600 miles per hour, do you really need a, a sub oceanic tube? Like I, that took, I, it goes I through like the fucking mantle of the earth. Paris. Yeah. Like that seems like a bigger investment yeah. than just getting the fucking cab who like, uh, you know, yeah, bankrolled yeah, that, that, that project. There was like, who was like, okay, fine. I'll bankroll your sub mantle. Uh, train system, James, even though I could just fucking take a cab and have the same experience. Yeah. There's also a weird line where it's suggested that agriculture is not science. Uh, It says that this is the line. Similar farms were used in America until Ralph undertook their study and approached the subject from a scientific angle. Like, dude, agriculture is a science. I just, (laughs) I don't know. They're still, you. you know, applying hypothesis about how this will grow and testing that and like, yeah, like it's a science. Building upon their result. Know. Yes. I don't know what you mean. How about that line about how if there's nothing to distract you or tire you out, you don't have to sleep? <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't make any sense. Um, there, there wasn't any sort of like explanation that humans have evolved away from the need for sleep or we just take these pills to like get rid of the sleep juice that we need. No, it's just like, oh, he was in the spaceship and because there wasn't much to do, he wasn't getting tired. And I mean, I don't know about you, Paris, but just the toil of existing day to day is enough to tire me out, you know, literally daily. So I did the people in the tw- early 20th century think that you could not have to sleep if you just didn't do anything? I, I guess. I don't think that was the case. I really don't think that was the case because assumingly there was people that didn't do shit all day back then. And they found that they were still tired at the end of the day. Yeah, it is. That is a really weird um, claim that he makes. There, I mean, there's other stuff too that, uh, like he thought that the spaceships didn't need heating because one side of them was always facing the sun and one side was always <laughs> facing not the sun, and so therefore the temperature inside would be perfect at all times and i was yeah, like that just, that's just not balanced. how that works as long as, okay <laughs> paris as long as you're always the same distance away from the sun as you are on the other side where there isn't anything or there's like another sun but it's too far like yeah man like the further you got away from the sun that temperature would change then right yeah. and therefore at a certain point you'd freeze uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah. It's just, Unless I you mean, have to keep your back to the whole, like, that side of the ship the it's, whole time. It's all right. He was trying. He was, ni- <laughs> it was 1911. He wasn't an astrophysicist. Like, he was doing yeah. his best. I get it. Yeah. Um. Oh, right. So back to, th- sorry, this is another one of those ideas where uh, the author makes it clear that this is a very lawful world. Um, I'm just going to read this. In a daze, Ralph returned to his laboratory, where he again called the central office, like the police. As all space flyers must be licensed by law, he had no trouble in getting the information he desired. A new machine of a well-known Detroit firm had been registered four days ago, and the description of the owner answered to that of Fernand 60010. So, in this world, 
people are so law abiding that even criminals will register the new vehicles that they're going to use for a kidnapping. Like, I mean, that just doesn't <laughs> fucking track. Like, I okay, but there's <laughs> also what? criminals because there's still a police station. Also, at one paragraph in the book, he talks about how criminals are used for his science experiments so that he doesn't have to endanger himself. So there's yes. criminals in the book. Yeah. So there's people that don't abide by the law. So I don't know. Just like this trust, or I guess like I guess the assumption is that there's not enough of them to overturn any system or something like that. Yeah, but I mean, but again, like ever, of course, everything in the story still subscribes to all of these assumptions that he makes. Yes, very yes. conveniently, <laughs> which yes. is a little silly, you know. And like he he assumes that the Martian uh, Lysenor. He's a Martian, therefore he's very patriotic, which is an interesting thing, an interesting recurring theme I've seen in a lot of sci-fi works where people from Mars are very, very patriotic. I guess it's, it's probably because they just associate Mars with the god of war and therefore, yeah. you know, path or whatever. It's patriotic. even true in the Expanse where, like, most of the Martian people yeah, are, like, yeah. very, like, I'm for Mars, we must fight for Mars. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. Uh, and... Anyway, you know, he's like, oh, he's he's a Martian, therefore he's probably going to be patriotic, so he's probably going to save his country before himself and try to intercept this comet. And that somehow works out, you know. <laughs> and then uh, Fernand, you know, he ends up, Lysenor tricks Fernand because he's like, ah, oh, well, Fernand will surely stop to help some uh, some travelers who are running out of air. And of course he does, even though he's a fucking villain. Why would he stop to give someone air when he's kidnapping some, he's mid kidnap. And he's like, Oh, let me go help these unfortunate people without air though. Like, I mean, nuanced, I mean, detailed characters, but, right but characters he was not, have. but he was not nuanced up until that yeah. point. So <laughs> yeah, it didn't true. make sense. You know, this is so, a one little layer of depth that he has. Uh, Oh man. There's also a case of missing white woman syndrome in here. Um, when Alice gets kidnapped and Ralph realizes she's gone, he, um, calls the central office and reports her missing. And within 15 minutes, every detective and special agent had been notified of the disappearance of Alice. (laughs) In the future, missing white woman syndrome is just intensified many fold. And I mean, this is kind of a nice segue into one of the biggest bits of like the actual because a lot of this is just us quibbling about like, ah you didn't get it right back a hundred years ago you w, you didn't get it right at all but like the, the one major thing is still of course the overwhelming presence of american exceptionalism and heteronormativity being the way things are yeah i mean we're still stuck in heteronormative cis western romance tropes right we have like like we said it's like super mario galaxy you have man saves woman Men and women fall in love at first sight. Men has to fend off other suitors. Woman is beautiful and feminine. Hopefully you can hear my air quotes. You know, but at least it's not it's not too heavy handed and gross. You know, we're not yes. getting like, oh, man, Alice is a plus space rack, you know, or like a 124 <laughs> plus space. Rack How or they floated amidst the zero <laughs> gravity. Yeah. And at least when whenever Ralph does talk about how much he likes Alice, he actually does make a point to say that he likes her for her strength of character and her, I think, like curious mind or, or something. Or yeah, he you know, specifically so, likes that she is a smart lady. Yeah, so it's not literally just oh she's real hot, and they also don't constantly bash you over the head with how hot she is, <laughs> which yeah. is nice. Um, Certainly, we, he's first infatuated with her because she looks nice, but that that's fine and normal. We're ne- we never hear saying that you should that physical attraction is not a component of probably initiating some romantic interest. Yeah, with someone, yeah. But it's just when you fucking stay on it, and that's all it's about. It's yeah. so tiring. Although weirdly, I don't think we really get a physical description of like any of the characters except for the Martian, which is kind of weird. Um, True. I mean, you get a little bit of like Alice's black hair, I think, but that's about it. I don't remember that she had black hair. If that was said, perhaps I, it was trivial enough that I forgot. Uh, yeah. I mean, this author is too focused on his cool science shit that he came up right. with to care about any sort of physical body descriptions. He's describing the fucking space car that they go flying off in way more than any physical being. In I gotta it. say, I kind of prefer that. Like, I'd much yes. rather you give me the fucking rundown and specs on your, I don't know, magic traveling toaster than, like, tell me what kind of <laughs> skirt this girl's wearing. Because ultimately, I don't really care. I care about what the characters are doing. Um, and I don't think we really get a description of Ralph either, which is also fine. I mean, it would have been nice if there was some kind of at least basic idea of what he looked like. But right now, like you said, it's just Professor Frank in my mind. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyhow, yeah. And the other thing that we also, of course, can't escape here is American exceptionalism, where um, 
you know, and, Nothing. There's a line where some guys like you Americans have really continued to be on top for hundreds of <laughs> yes, years. <yeah>. Wowee! <laughs> yeah, I mean it, it's literally panning out right now, is it? <laughs> yeah, it's literally stated in the text. Like the man may as well have been like wearing a fucking American flag. It was like Uncle Sam, basically, is what it felt like. <laughs> You know, like New York City is the hub of the the best technology, the highest levels of um, efficiency and and well being for the populace and things like that. Um, the Europeans are impressed with the Americans. There and there's just no thought about anywhere outside of America and Europe other than literally Mars. Like writers would rather talk about fucking Martians <laughs> than they would people in the Middle East or Africa or Asia or the only time Africa is brought up is when they like think about putting farms for food there. That's the only time Africa is mentioned at all. Oh yeah, you're right. There is one mention. So, you know, an incredibly, you know, Western white centric, like, like most things are that we read 1911, right? Like, what do you expect at this point? Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, Things are still fucking pretty colonial at that point, so not that surprising. Uh, but yeah, um, what else? I don't know. Uh, can we fix it? I think we could just jump right to can we fix it? Yeah, I guess that's it. I mean, there are a few other nitpicky things in the text, but yeah, I don't know. I guess we can just move to the final piece, which is can we fix it? Chris, can we fix it? I don't know if it needs it. I, you know, it's it's a charming time capsule of what life will be like in the future. And aside from the stuff we just mentioned, all that American exceptionalism and heteronormativity kind of guiding a lot of the plot, the paper thin plot that's <laughs> happening here. There's not a lot to fix. And I, I mean, if I don't think we should be trying to go back and say this book from 1911 should have fixed this because there's some value to being able to see the cultural norms from back then I, you know i don't know how much you want to dig into what i what i mean by fix and what we're trying to fix from the past or not so ultimately this is just a charming little jaunt through one guy's ideas of what will happen in the future with a you know paper thin sci-fi romance kind of thing slapped on top and that's fine um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to disagree with you and I'm not, I'm not, I don't think that, I don't think we can just say, oh, it was written in the past. Therefore it's, it's absolved of all writings, all I'm sins not it's absolved, writing or other eyes. I guess, <laughs> when I, I guess what I, what I was trying to say is when you say fix, is, should it mean rewrite this now? No, you shouldn't rewrite this because it, it's from that time period. No, but I if, think you absolutely should rewrite this. I think somebody could rewrite this and turn this into a more Blade Runner-esque, like, cooler thing where we still get all the fun inventions, but the rest of the plot could be more, more clever, you know, in presentation. Like, if there was an actual mystery to be solved and the tone was a bit more serious, um, you know, and also if if the sciencey parts weren't just literally, like... And then I made this and it works like this. Oh, and then that over there is that thing. And I made that like this. And then, oh my God, you have to see this thing that I also made. And it works like this. You know, if it wasn't just like a tour of, <laughs> of him literally walking the scroll around New York city and explaining, the yeah. <laughs> you know, if, if the device was a little more clever and if there was a bit more kind of like blade runnery grit, because that's sort of the sci-fi that I tend to like. And I think also would fit this and make it better. Um, yeah, I, I, I just don't think we've ever before been like, yeah, eh, you know it was written point. that year or whatever. Like, that's not, yeah. not a thing we normally do. So, sorry, I, know, Chris. I guess I was trying to like, gra- I was trying to grapple with the idea of like, there is some value in being able to read the cultural norms of that time in a text like this. Yeah, uh, I, but, I, I think so too, but we can still say that, Hey, you know, if it were written now, like this is what we would have preferred or. You know, I mean, I'm not. I guess I was being... also tied up in like, would you rewrite it back in time then or rewrite it now? You know, that's all. I, you know what? I'm getting too in the weeds here. Ultimately, I feel I've changed my mind and I agree with you. Now. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, I was a little surprised there. Um, anyhow, yeah, yeah. Of course, you know, anything is a is a snapshot, right? Any any writing is gonna mm-hmm. be a snapshot of um, the author at the time t- in the circumstances you know, in which they are writing. And of course that is valuable, but you know, we always give 
critiques and ideas for how we think something could be improved. And I don't know. I think that it's, it's easy for a lot of people to think like, Oh, back, back then things were just, you know, white racist. And it's like, well, things are white and racist now. It doesn't mean that, like, <laughs> it doesn't yeah. mean that we have to leave them that way. Right. We can. True. And also there were plenty of people who weren't, you know, racist and who were inventing things who weren't white. And, you know, so anyway, so I, I'm not trying to get into like a, a deep discussion here about these things. I'm just saying that I think it is okay. For I us can to see say, to your point and you're yeah. correct. Oh no, I'm not trying to convince you. I'm sure, I'm sure plenty of listeners don't want to hear me say this, but oh well, uh, I'm more con- yeah. trying to convince them that, you know, I think it's okay to say, oh, you know, it's too bad. It wasn't like this. And, but I know, also agree with your point that like you could have done it in a slightly more blade. You keep using the blade runner example. And I agree, like having there be like a little mystery and like you have all this stuff amongst that, um, Neuromancer was a little bit like that, even though a lot of that stuff was focused on like VR and AI tech more than anything. But there was like still like, and this worked like that, and this worked like this. But I haven't read, I haven't read that yet. But someone actually requested that we read that for the show, and it's on the I have it's on the recommendations list. I have already read it. I mean, that's okay. I it's been on my to be my TBR list for like a couple years now, and I haven't gotten to it. So anyway, um. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's like like Chris said, you know, with the context of the time period, it's whatever. It's a pulpy sort of Disney level, <laughs> like it's kind of silly story that's really just there as, as a as a service to to show you all these inventions that this guy came up with. <laughs> and ultimately, even a hundred years later, I am amused. Yeah, and I actually I actually wonder if people couldn't get something from his ideas about um, like food production. And it, it really seems like they actually do have a pretty equitable system here where everyone has enough food and clothing and stuff because everything is able to be produced cheaply and the government has control over <laughs> science and production. So it does seem like they're, they're a relatively egalitarian society. Although, I mean, this is just the rosy picture we're getting from this very, <laughs> very yeah. Disney like kind yes. of silly story. So, but anyway, um, there are some ideas in here that I think people could still benefit from. And yeah, it's, you know, it's not highbrow and it's certainly not one of the best stories I've ever read, but I think better than most we've read here. It's got, it's got some redeeming qualities. You know, I don't, I don't know that people need to shit on it as much as it seems they have. I did very, I did a very light cursory reading about like, oh, what did people think of this? And it seems like people in general kind of hated it. <laughs> so um, I would recommend it to someone as like a cute way to like, you know, if you want to read what this guy had an idea of te- future tech, it's it's interesting enough to read. I think for modern readers, it would be very boring. I don't know that I would recommend this to modern readers unless they were into kind of that style of that sort of more Victorian ish style of writing. Um, it's not too dated, but I, I just think that the way it clips along and the expanded technical explanations, I just don't know that the average reader would be down with that, (laughs) but true. (sighs) Anyway, not great, but you know, if you're in the space market, just checking out and this is on the shelf you know, it's it's there for your next d- dentist office visit in space. <laughs> yeah. Also in space. Everything is in space. William Shatner's in space. <sighs> oh, I'm imagining this book narrated by him. That'd be uh, a trip, actually. I don't like... Oh God, I'm not a fan. All right. It's well, always... let's thank the patrons. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, patrons and Kofiites. Coffeeites. Sorry, I know it, I know it's coffee, but it just looks like Kofi to me. Thank you, patrons and coffeeites. Uh, thank you, Dari, Greg, Veronica, Will, D, Jared, Lynn, Sinya, Yakub, Bobby, Black Cat, Like Horace, Elliot, Kieran, Martin, Jay, Scott, Luchak, CTAP, One, Miri, Yanka, David, Julius, Anya, Anonymous, Patricia. Austin, Donnie, Crimson Paladin, and Lex Stoties. Uh, special thanks goes to Patricia for recommending this book to us and also for providing a, um, a link to this book for free because it is part of Project Gutenberg. So that was a really lovely uh, no-cost Patreon <laughs> patron episode. Thank you <laughs> which very we really, much. Which we really appreciate. Yes. Uh, you yes. know, Mick, we, actually, we actually do have a healthy amount of 
uh, free books mixed into the schedule each year to make it affordable. So we <laughs> appreciate that. Yes. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot, Patricia. I hope this review was at least interesting to you. I'm, I don't really know what, what you're expecting uh, from us, but hopefully it was at least a little bit fun. Thanks again for being a dedicated patron. And uh, we look forward to reading something for you again next year. If, uh, if you too want to help support the show, you can subscribe uh, to our Teletube. Uh, you can get on YouTube and subscribe, leave a comment, like a video, whatever. Uh, you can donate to us on Patreon or over at uh, ko-fi.com slash terrible book club uh, for like extra content. If you, if you want to just throw us money, you can go to coffee, Kofi, whatever. Otherwise, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Goodreads. If you want to contact us directly, you can send an email to us at terriblebookclub at gmail.com, or you can send us a message on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Goodreads, or Patreon. Uh, if you like the show, please write a review. We would appreciate that. Please. And if you write a review, we'll read it on the next episode. Uh, most importantly, though, just uh, share the show. Keep listening. Keep, uh, keep enjoying the show. Yeah, I'm uh, not following the script. I am... Floating off into space. Oh no! Someone's kidnapped you, and I must go after you. But I'll pretend to be a comet to get them to follow me first, so they can nudge me out of the gravitational pull of the of the planet, and then, well, uh, you know, Chris, find you stabbed, and I'll have to. It's the magnolium, with your Chris. <laughs> it's the magnolium, Chris. We need the magnolium. Damn you! The magnolium. There's literally a rant about the magnolium. I've made it, and now I've been undone by my own substance. <laughs> yeah. All right, all right. Well, uh, we'll, we'll leave you with this little silly piece of sci-fi nostalgia, and we uh, bid you bid you adieu until next time. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye.